Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, for us, it's good evening. I guess for some of you, maybe it's good morning. Um, can you see and hear us? If you can please type uh, on the chat. Hello. Mic check, mic check. All right, great. Okay, someone other than Shiri who uh, is uh, local here. Can, can everyone else uh, hear us? Okay, thank you, Abida. Um, so, hello, everyone, and um, and uh, welcome to another uh, Stark at Home uh, informal webinar where we give some, we try to discuss some intuition be behind some of the math and, and, and thinking that, that we're going through as we're, you know, building and designing uh, such systems. Um, this. This week, uh, it's, uh, it's a very special uh, honor for me to have here Alessandro Chiesa. Uh, we've been collaborating uh, for, I think, more than 10 years by now. Um, uh, so we started writing a bunch of papers. Um, we are together uh, founding scientists of uh, Zcash, and also we're co-founders of uh, Starkware. And in that capacity, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have uh, Alessandro here today. And I just want to present the kind of problem that, that uh, we'll be discussing. So um, when all is said and done, um, you know, a Stark proof arrives uh, very, it's, it's something that's very short. It's exponentially shorter and smaller than uh, the amount of computation that is attested to, okay? But uh, somewhere within this universe that, that has both a prover and a verifier, someone has to spend a lot of uh, time doing the computation. Moreover, um, actually, um, when you start analyzing these proof systems um, in, in a certain model that is called the interactive oracle proof model, but also in other models that are similar to it, actually the prover uh, it creates these huge um, messages and these huge uh, um, uh, amounts of information that, you know, somewhere in the analysis uh, play a role. But, but then they disappear and they magically shrink. And they shrink with use of cryptography. So the topic of today's uh, talk, and I'll hand it to Alessandro. I, I forgot to mention, Alessandro is also a professor of computer science at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, so the, 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 the talk today is going to be about what is the uh, you know, math, cryptography, what are the assumptions, and what's the intuition behind this process of taking very long protocols that involve huge messages and securely and safely shrinking them. So, Alessandro, uh, please take over. Just one comment for those who don't know the, uh, how to work with the Crowdcast. Uh, at the bottom, you'll see this thing called ask a question, and you can uh, ask a question. Um, I'm just saying a test question, and then you can see that uh, you, so please add your questions there, and once in a while, Alessandro will come back and, and answer some questions. So, Alessandro, all yours. Thank you so much, Eli, for the introduction. Um, happy to be here and uh, uh, tell you about how you construct uh, uh, start proofs um, from uh, interactive Oracle proofs. Let me share uh, my screen where I'm going to be writing. Um, All right, so you should all, at this point, be able to both hear me and see my shared screen. Uh, can can you please confirm? Can can you all see my screen? And uh, Eli, can you? Okay. Oh yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. So <clears throat> let's start. Um, so let's start by basically saying, let's remind ourselves, look, Stark, Starks, they are a cryptographic object. And uh, like many other cryptographic objects like it in the area of uh, Snarks and Starks, it is a combination of an actually an information theoretic object, in this case, an interactive oracle proof, and a cryptographic object, in this case, a cryptographic hash function. So <clears throat> what you should have in mind and, is that we have this high-level combination of two building blocks, 
Okay, so we have this information theoretic proof. That's one building block. And we're gonna, in this case, we're going to combine it to a cryptographic hash function. You can think about it as uh, SHA-256 or like Blake, something like that, okay? And we're going to get the Stark proof system, okay? Now, uh, <clears throat> now, all of you may are probably familiar with what is a cryptographic hash function, but what I'm here to discuss is, you know, what is this type of information theory proof system that uh, you know, lies underneath and, and somehow how does the cryptographic hash function help us achieve a succinct communication, despite the fact that if the information theory proof actually involves large proofs, okay? So let me uh, introduce this model in uh, two steps. First, I'm gonna tell you about a simplified model that is known as a PCP, probabilistically checkable proof. And then I will tell you what is the actual model that we do use, which is a, a slight generalization of it, that is known as interactive oracle proof, okay? And, and then I will primarily focus on how do you take a PCP into a Stark, and then it will be pretty easy from there to see uh, how do you take an IOP and turn it into a Stark, okay? So a probabilistically checkable proof is a proof uh, that for some statement, for example, uh, let's say that we're trying to prove that uh, there exists some uh, secret input X such that uh, F of X equals one, okay, for a given F, okay? So for example, F could be uh, some computation that does some very long hash chain. Uh, you know some pre-image such that after a very long hash chain, you get a particular output. Uh, for example, you know, the all one string. Um, so we denote usually these things by pi. And these are proofs, these are proof strings that are as, at least as long as the computation. In fact, typ typically much longer. You should think about them as, you know, 10 times bigger as your computation, 100 times bigger as your computation. And and so what, right? You know, why would you ever take a computation and, and, and sort of write it in this redundant format? The point is that there is a verification procedure known as the PCP verifier that is able to locally query a, this uh, object at a few locations, okay, at a small number of queries, local queries, and it will be able to assess whether the proof is uh, valid or not. Okay, so if the statement was true, you want with probability one, this uh, small number of queries to the proof to make the verifier accept. And if the statement was not true, then you want with high probability over the choice of the randomness of the verifier, the queries are going to return answers that are not accepted uh, by the verifier, okay? And it turns out that uh, uh, we can build uh, these objects unconditionally. Like we can actually just rely on math, no cryptographic assumptions, and we can basically take any computation and rewrite it in this redundant format it was a little bit longer, such that we can make a very small number of queries to the PCP string to check it, okay? Uh, by the way, feel free to, I mean, I, I am trying to keep an eye on the on the, um, on the the question tab, you know, feel free to kind of uh, ask things as we go along, all right? Uh, and, you know, these things have been around since the 90s, and uh, uh, actually since the 90s, we know how to, uh, you know, put this together with the with the hash function and you know get something that looks like a stark the problem is that we don't really have efficient constructions of pcps i mean once you give me a good pcp uh, i know how to use a hash function and construct a stark and we'll see that in the next uh, sort of uh, slide uh, but uh, um, at starkware and more generally in the sort of applied cryptography community today, we don't really use PCPs to instantiate this paradigm because we don't have efficient constructions of them. Instead, what we do have are efficient constructions of a relaxation of the notion of a PCP, something that is known as an interactive oracle proof, okay? And pictorially, it's just basically like an interactive analog of this notion 
where now you have an IOP prover and an IOP verifier. And the IOP prover is going to send, is going to write out you know, some big string. You should think about it as a first PCP. Uh, the IOP verifier may, you know, may choose to query it at whatever locations it wants. OK? By querying a location, I mean that it is interested to read an index of the proof, and it will get back the answer. But then the protocol doesn't end here. The verifier might say, OK, uh, actually, I'm not, I mean, we're not done <laughs> like talking about the statement. Here is uh, some uh, random message. Let's call it you know, random message R1. Please send me you know, another PCP. The prover does so. The verifier can again you know, query this one at uh, uh, random locations. And this interaction continues for some number of rounds until the verifier, or at least until the protocol is over. Okay, And this number of, interac number of rounds could even be two or three, four. In, in, in practical constructions in the real world, this is actually usually a logarithmic number of rounds. Okay. Now, uh, you can see that PCP is a special case of uh, this model, right? It's just a non-interactive IOP. It's a one-message IOP. And an exciting line of works that started you know, about five years ago has been to realize that uh, we don't have to tie our hands and design good PCPs if we are interested in constructing Starks. It actually suffices to design you know, something a bit, bit more relaxed. And we can use the full design space of IOPs, and it turns out that you know, taking advantage of this extra interaction, uh, researchers uh, have been able to design much, much more efficient uh, IOPs than we know uh, uh, for PCPs. Okay, uh, and just like for PCPs, IOPs are unconditional objects that we just know how to construct. So the way you should conceptualize these information theoretic models is they're just idealizations. We just kind of Imagine some world where the verifier can magically query these long strings, but in the real world, you know, we can't really use these long strings. You know, how are you gonna kind of <laughs> tell the verifier, by the way, here's this long string, go ahead and make your small number of queries to it. Where am I gonna write this string? You know, I can't send it to the verifier because that's gonna cost me, you know, bandwidth that is linear in the computation. Uh, so we don't have like this query access. So this query or sometimes Oracle access, we're going to implement it with cryptography. So that's the role of the hash function in, in both, where it will be used to kind of compress away and create a situation where the verifier doesn't actually have to receive any large strings, but it only has to receive, as we'll see soon, commitments uh, to these. And you know, we'll have to kind of use the hash function to uh, kind of implement the query access. Um, all right, so I'm about to change slides and talk about first how do we turn a PCP into a star, and then you know we'll see how to uh, modify that to go into an uh, IOP. But uh, maybe this is a good uh, uh, time for me to take any questions about the first slide. Specifically, I'm interested to understand whether a people are comfortable with the notion of a PCP and an IOP. Uh, now, of course, where these objects come from, that's an entirely different story that is not the subject of uh, a, today's a discussion. You, some of the past instances of Stark at Home have discussed some of these uh, uh, pieces. And if you're interested into the you know, nitty gritty details, I've, I've actually been teaching a semester online course about precisely all these things. Uh, and you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of recorded lectures about that. I see here, maybe there's a question. <clears throat> what does it mean to have an information theory construction? So information theory construction means that the security guarantees of uh, um, uh, the soundness of the proof system hold against unbounded adversaries or basically any attack you can bring to the system, you know, we can you know, be secure against it, regardless of whether you know, we have good cryptography or not, right? Uh, one uh, example, an analogy, you can sort of uh, 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 compare the 
one-time pad for encrypting information, that is just an information theoretic way of in, uh, encrypting information. You don't need to rely on RSA or um, a quadratic residuosity or some other like number theoretic assumption for the encryption scheme to work. For one-time pad, it just works, okay? Uh, these objects, PCPs and IOPs, we just know to construct them, period. We don't need to rely on any assumption. Later, you know, when we combine them with a hash function, well, we need to know that the hash function is a good hash function, as, you know, as we'll see what it, uh, what it means in the next slide. But, you know, for example, you, we rely on the fact that you cannot find efficiently, say, collisions or invert values for the hash function, you know, but, and that's what the security of Stark eventually would rely on, such things. But for the PCP and the IOP, these are just idealized models and, you know, there's, there's no uh, cryptographic uh, sort of hardness assumptions. Okay, so I don't see any other questions. Uh, so I may, uh, okay, there's one question. Uh, <clears throat> so a okay, great question. So there's a question about, you know, is the verifier reading each PCP at each step or will it do it at the end? So here uh, I was discussing as if it, it, was, it was doing it along the way. Uh, actually in all constructions that we have, it doesn't have to do it along the way. It, it may as well do it at the end. And in fact, we will actually rely on this fact in the compiler. You know, you can construct IOPs where maybe you want to read along the way, but we will, but you know, those are kind of unnatural IOPs. All the efficient constructions that we have, the verifier can read the queries at the end. And in the compiler we'll talk about, it will be uh, not just convenient, but essentially necessary that it reads things at the end. Okay, uh, a bit sort of, cheating there, but it will be easiest for today to think that all the queries are asked at the end. So maybe with that in mind, let me maybe slightly modify this diagram to designate that there is an interaction with, uh, let's call it the interaction phase. And uh, uh, at the end, there is the query phase where queries are made to all the oracles that have been sent so far. And after the query phase, the, the verifier decides where to accept or reject. Okay. All right. So we let's talk about the hash function because you know that's that's what that's the main point for today. Let's focus on uh, um, first PCPs because it's easy. And at high level, our a goal is that we, we want to kind of cryptographically implement query access to this long string. Okay, let me move this a little bit. It turns out that there's actually a very familiar uh, uh, construct that does precisely that for us. It's known as a Merkle tree. We can take the hash function and use it to pairwise hash entries of this uh, a long string, and you can sort of keep pairwise hashing until we reach and obtain this root. Ale, I'm not sure we see what you're uh, writing. Um... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. Ah. So I'm writing on the iPad, and I'm sharing like a, a browser uh, in my in my laptop. Thank you. And uh, and in retrospect, uh, my browser you know, doesn't know what is happening on my iPad beyond showing. Yeah, thank you. Um, right. So this is a Merkle tree. In order to construct a Merkle tree, all you really need is a compressing cryptographic cryptographic hash function. For example, you need to be able to let's say map a two times lambda bits to lambda bits. For example, five hundred and twelve bits to 256 bits, okay? And we can think that this is happening, all of this is happening in the head of the, let's call it the Stark Prover. So the Stark Prover that we wanna construct, it, it is interested, they are interested in a, sort of interacting with the Stark verifier, but we have bandwidth limitations. We cannot just send over a long PCP string, okay? This is, this is the PCP string. So instead it will say, okay, let's commit to it pairwise 
using the, uh, the, the hash function. And we're going to send the Merkle root to the Stark verifier. Now, at this point in time, the Stark verifier, from a cryptographic perspective, it's as if it has received the actual PCP string, but it didn't really physically, it just received like a succinct or a short cryptographic commitment to it. Um, but the good thing is that at this point, the Stark verifier can run the PCP verifier who will be interested to query this string at say, let's say a couple of locations. So it will send over requests for saying, hey, hey, I'm looking, I, I would really like to inspect these two locations, okay? Now at this point, because of the structure of Merkle tree that you, uh, uh, by the way, if people are not familiar with Merkle trees, you know, please, uh, I'm kind of assuming you at least vaguely heard about it, so at least in the, in the blockchain space they're used a number of places. If you are interested, let's say, in these two leaves, then one way to convince, then then what the, a, let's call this uh, these values uh, V and uh, V1 and V2, what the prover will do, it will say, okay, look, the answers to your queries are V1 and V2. But of course, the, you know, <laughs> the verifier, uh, may not trust that these are the right answers. Maybe the people just made them up, right? But crucially, because of the structure of the Merkle tree, uh, the prover can accompany these uh, answers with so-called authentication paths that certify that these are correct relative to the previously received root. So what the start prover will do, it will include the sibling, let's say, of this... Uh, of this entry here, right? And then the sibling of the parent, right? So the parent is this one, so it will include this one over here, then the sibling of the parent to parent, right? And so on and so forth, right? And let's maybe change color again. For this other one, it will include the sibling. Uh, this, this is the other sibling, and then sort of the rest is already included. With these so-called authentication paths, let's call them uh, authentication path one and authentication path two, each of them kind of they certify the respective answer. Uh, the Stark verifier can check the answers. So it will kind of take V1 and V2 and return them to the verifier here who it's going to check, we'll accept. And then we'll have somehow, uh, let's call it a Merkle check on uh, you know V1 relative to AP1 and the root, and on V2 relative to AP2 and the root. OK? So in other words, this Merkle tree is acting as, as a succinct commitment that crucially has a so-called local opening. OK? So, these are local openings. And they allow us to certify answers about a long string without sending it over the wire. Okay. See here, there is a question. Uh, <clears throat> the question is, uh, you know, <clears throat> okay, they're part of the PCP string. V1 and V2 are part of the PCP string, but really they should be not just part of the PCP string, but they should be at the part particular location. And yes, the authentication paths AP1 and AP2, they are for the uh, you know, desired locations. So maybe here I could be more precise and say here is the index for the first one and the index for the second one. And in the check, in the Merkle check, really, you should tell the Merkle check, hey, this one was for index one and this one was for index two. And the structure of the authentication path will let you check that it is not just basically part of a set, but it's part of an ordered list, okay, at that specific location, okay? And, you know, that's clear, for example, here, because you're giving the right sibling, oopsie, you're giving the right sibling here and the left sibling here and the right sibling here and the right sibling here, 
kind of which of the siblings you provide an authentication path uniquely determines, you know, which location you're checking. And so over here, by knowing the location, you can relate it to the authentication path so that indeed it is the correct location. So good question. All right. So the punchline here is that using very basic cryptography, essentially, we didn't use any pairings, we didn't use any homomorphisms, we didn't use any polynomial commitment schemes. We just use hashing, okay, which for which we have many, many candidates, including post-quantum ones, because this, these just don't really have any structure. We can take a long string, shrink it down, send it to the verifier. The verifier can tell us the answers, and then the prover can kind of reveal those specific locations. And now <clears throat> we have the property that the transcript of interaction is basically proportional essentially to a, let's say, number of queries times the logarithm of the PCP length, right, as opposed to the PCP length itself. And the verifier can, uh, a, a crypto, from a cryptographic perspective, it doesn't have to worry about a, a, the prover cheating because he would have to you know, break the security of the Merkle tree in order to cheat. Now, this can actually be quantified. So let me just say that, you know, because in practice, it's important to kind of relate the concrete security of this construction to the concrete security of the underlying PCP. So you can actually say, you know, some, let's call it some, some, some formal theorem. I'll put it in quote, because it's, uh, you know, I'll be stating it informal. But if the probability, if the maximum probability of winning against the PCP is, let's say, epsilon PCP. So you can think about it, uh, I don't know, two to the one, two to the minus 128. Then the probability of winning against, in this case, it is an interactive Stark. We'll talk about the non-interactive uh, version in a moment, interactive Stark is epsilon PCP plus well, plus what? Well, we're going to have to uh, pick how, ex how how powerful is the, the adversary. So if the adversary, is a, let's say, has time t, then here we're going to put t squared over so-called 2 to the lambda. What is that? Well, our hash function here, we're going to model it as a so-called random oracle. It's a random function. Okay, so let's call it uh, H, and it's gonna map two lambda bits, two lambda bits, okay? So, uh, for example, if you pick, let's just uh, uh, play with numbers here. Let's say that you pick lambda to be 256 bits, okay? Then, um, well, actually, maybe that's gonna take us too far afield, so let's, uh, um, but essentially, essentially here, oops, the bigger the output of the hash function, the more you can drive down this basically cryptographic overhead. This is the cryptographic overhead, and this is just the security of the information theory you started from. Okay, so if you want the whole thing to be secure, you're going to need both the cryptography to be secure and the information theoretic proof system underneath to be secure. See so here some question. Uh, <clears throat> There's a question about you know, why is it important to send the siblings? It, because you want the uh, verifier to be able to reconstruct uh, and check against the root. So let's say the verifier was interested in this location, and we're going to have to link this location to the root. Well, how are we going to do it? Well, I'm going to need the siblings so I can get here. Now I have this digest, but then you know I need to kind of go up again, so I'm going to need the siblings so I can recompute this one. Then I need the sibling, so I recompute this one, and I need this sibling, so I can recompute this one. I can check that what I recompute is indeed the root that I received earlier. So I need to be able to kind of go back up to the root. That's why your siblings are there for us. Okay. So the so-called authentication path is basically the co-path of the leaf to the root. So it's all the siblings of everything you find from your path to the root. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So there's another question about all Merkle trees essentials. Could we have other more efficient ways to commit to the PCP that would have certificates of membership in the PCP? Yes, these are called vector commitments, and we can construct vector commitments 
uh, using other assumptions. Uh, not you can use number theory things. For example, we can construct a sort of in certain settings. It is uh, let's say more efficient to use pairing-based vector commitments, or sometimes lattice-based vector commitments. Uh, but today we're going to focus specifically on uh, just talking about with kind of this extremely bare bones cryptography of just basically no structure, just like a random function. There's a question here about you know what is t? This is the time of the adversary, uh, or more precisely, we actually. Are not even going to care about how long the verifier runs. All we really care about is the number of invocations of the hash function, and and this t squared over two to the lambda should look familiar, which is basically just the birthday bound. It is the cost of deriving finding a collision with some constant probability, let's say. And intuitively, that makes sense that it should appear here as t squared over lambda because if you could find collisions, then you could cheat. Right, and you know I'm not going to get into it too much, but essentially you can prove that you know this is all you're going to worry about. Uh, so that's why this cost is here. Now, if you really, really care about concrete security, then uh, you know, uh, one can uh, one, one can tighten this one. But you know, to a, to a uh, sort of first order, uh, that's the cost there. What I would like to do next. Well, first I should maybe see if there are additional questions, but what I would like to do next is talk about how you take this three message protocol and make it non-interactive so that uh, you can then write it down, let's say in a transaction. And when you make it non-interactive, it's actually gonna change this expression. So it's gonna affect, actually going to affect the security of your scheme. And the punchline is that you're gonna have to make your PCP and later the IOP more secure, okay? But are there any questions? I think this three message protocol, by the way, is, in my opinion, it is one of the most, I think it's the simplest way from the pedagogical perspective and implementation perspective, once you have the PCP, to implement what is called a succinct argument, okay? It's like almost elementary. You just need to understand what is a hash function and you know what is a PCP. Given those two definitions, constructing this three message succinct argument is, uh, you know, elementary. You don't really need any number theory, nothing, okay? Uh, any questions about this slide? Okay, remember, we have yet to make things non-interactive and we haven't even talked about IOPs yet. But, you know, let's first make things non-interactive because it's going to help us. So let me see if I can copy this diagram into the next slide. No, I can't. Let's see if I can copy the entire slide. Duplicate. Yes. All right. So I can copy the entire slide. Let me switch over to slide three. And I'm going to cancel some things. And <clears throat> And now we're going to talk about how do we make this thing non-interactive. All right. Now let's focus our attention to this second message here, which is basically the, the only reason for the interaction. Now, in general, indices for a PCP are not random. But I actually don't really need to send, I don't really need to send the indices to the verifier. So to the prover, the verifier doesn't really need to send the indices to the prover. At this point, the verifier could just send the randomness of the PCP verifier. So let's think that instead of sending indices, we're gonna send, so I'm gonna cross this out, we're gonna send the randomness R that is used for the test here. So let me kind of add it back here. Uh, you know, here there is maybe some input here, right? And there is some randomness that is being used to run the PCP verifier. And let's say that th that is what we send. So then over here, it will be the prover's a kind of a job to kind of derive queries from the randomness. Anyways, they're determined. 
So <laughs> let the prover do that, OK? Um, but now something happens, which is we obtain something that is called a public coin protocol. Now, public coin means that the verifier, when it is sending something to the prover, it's just randomness, OK? So, so this brings to a very uh, beautiful and powerful idea, which is to say, OK, well, we already have this hash function around, and it's a random function. Why don't we ask the prover to derive randomness for the PCP verifier directly from the root? And the prover can do it himself in his head. So pictorially, what we're doing here is to say, OK, we're going to kind of the Stark verifier, we're just not going to have him interact at all with the prover. So let me move, let me move this check further down. And we're just going to uh, we're just going to ask the prover to say, all right, you know, prover, why don't you do something else for me? Uh, rather than asking for the verifier to do this part, just take your root, stick it into the hash function. Remember the hash function, we're modeling it as a random function. And you will get out of it some randomness. OK, so the prover can just do that in his head. Now, uh, this way, what the prover can do is, in, is later, it will send us the root in this one non-interactive message. It will be the root, the answers, and if you think authentication paths relative to the root. And now I have an additional check in the snark verifier, which is I need to make sure that the randomness that I'm using was indeed derived from the root. OK? So I'm going to be running as a Stark verifier when I receive this message. I'm going to take the root, derive the same randomness that was used by the prover. OK? And uh, I will use that to run the, the PCP verifier in my head. And then, of course, like before, I will check all the authentication paths. OK? So this is a, a paradigm that is known as the Fiat Shamir transform. OK? And it basically, you know, it is a, I guess it's, it's doesn't really have like you know super precise definition because it kind of behaves differently in different settings, but it essentially means you know when you have something interactive and you need randomness and before you would have gotten it from the verifier, now you just kind of uh, take the things that have happened so far, you stash them into the hash function as an input so that the it, the output randomness produced by the hash function kind of depends on the things so far, okay, and. Because the hash function takes those things as input, you cannot, like it's kind of intuitively hard to pick your randomness to be convenient for you. Because if you don't like the randomness, you're gonna have to go back and change the root, right? And I will come back that come, come back to that in a second, but I wanna maybe slow down for a moment and say syntactically, is it clear what modification we've done from the prior protocol? We have just recognized that the message from the the only message from the verifier to the prover was just randomness. And that we can at least intuitively derive it directly from the hash function. Is this intuition clear, or at least? Uh, <clears throat> All right. So now there's a question. I see. Is there a security issue because the randomness now comes from the prover? Now there is an additional thing that we're going to have to worry about, but it turns out that it's not really a big deal. Okay. Now we have a hash function, and the hash function has to be secure enough, right? So now. Suddenly, we are not using the hash function just for collision resistance, but we're also relying on basically some pseudo-random properties of, of the hash function. So we are relying, for example, on the fact that the hash function, it outputs strings that look random, right? So if we believe that's the case, because this is a good hash function, and again, in analysis, we actually model it as a truly random function, uh, we shouldn't worry about you know the prover lying on randomness because 
the only randomness we will ever be using over here are derived from the hash function because we're going to do it ourselves. So the prover knows that. So like, <laughs> so the prover knows that I'm, I'm going to take the root and use this randomness, the root, the randomness that is the output of the hash function on the root that he chose, right? So, and we know by kind of, by the hash function that anything, any, anytime you put something in, out comes something random looking. But there is, the prover has a little bit of extra power than before. Can anybody spot what is the extra power it has? It's something that we'll be able to handle, but there is a specific new type of attack that we need to make sure it's fine, okay? Like, it is true that the, every time you put something in a hash function, you get randomness. But what is different now than before? Like, a cheating prover, what could he do now that he couldn't do before? So let, here's a hint. So let's say that the prover, I don't know, construct, uh, constructs a Merkle tree. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, um, it gets a root. It stashes it into the hash function and gets out randomness it doesn't like. Why it doesn't like it? Because, you know, it can already, uh, ah, there we go, excellent. So uh, thank you, Harish. The prover can now try many inputs to the hash function until it gets a randomness that it likes, right? Notice, crucially, in the interactive one, it couldn't do it. Like, whenever the verifier sent the randomness, the prover can't just say, sorry, please send me another one. The verifier will immediately detect that the prover is trying to cheat, and it will say, you know, go to that place, right? Uh, <clears throat> so, but now that the, very, the, the prover is basically simulating this first round of interaction in its head, it could say, yeah, I got like a randomness I don't really like. Let me just, I don't know, change one location in the Merkle tree, say this, this leaf over here, it will kind of ripple up, it will give a different root, and you can do it you know, with a small amount of work. And now a different root will give you basically a new sample, right? And so now you can basically kind of sample many times until maybe you get a randomness that you like. So that looks uh, dangerous. But you know, it's dangerous only up to a certain point because remember, the prover is not infinitely powerful. Every time he does this, he expends a budget of one on the hash function, right? So there's only so many invocations of hash function he can do within his resources. So he can do it once, twice, three times, four times. He cannot do it two to the thousand times. He can do it, I don't know, two to the 128 times or two to the hundred times, that's it. Right, And the analysis of this protocol shows a you know, related theorem to the, and again, I mean, it's informal, that <clears throat> again, if the PCP, uh, so if, uh, what did I say, in, I'm sorry, I forget what I said in the previous slide. The, yeah. If the probability of winning versus the PCP is again, you know, some parameter epsilon PCP, then the probability, oopsie, probability of winning against, now we have the non-interactive Stark is now, it's a related but different expression. It is T times epsilon PCP plus T squared over to the lambda. So the, the new feature here of this expression is this um, kind of multiplier in front of the uh, uh, PCP term that basically captures the fact that you can resample up to t times, okay? And so, you know, if your probability of winning against the PCP in one experiment is epsilon PCP, and you do this t times, then intuitively your probability grows up to t times epsilon PCP, okay? And you can see that you know with like you know some simple inclusion exclusion argument, okay? Uh, so this is the security of a non-interactive stock. And this, by the way, this is the reason. This is the main reason why uh, many interactive protocols 
like the ones produced according to this transformation, you can typically set the parameters of the underlying cryptography uh, with smaller digests. Whereas when you consider a non-interactive variance, you have to up the security of the underlying objects because here, you know, we're going to have to make the PCP withstand this resampling attack. Okay, so basically, in sum, this expression. Oopsie. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the resampling attack, attacking the PCP directly, and this is collision attack, attacking the Merkle tree. Okay, and so by setting the error of your PCP, choosing the output of the digest, and choosing the power of your adversary, again, T is the number of invocations of a hash function, or you can think about it as the time of the verifier. You can then make sure that uh, um, this error over here, this probability of success is small, right? That's how you can make things secure. Um, all right, so, <clears throat> Hopefully this makes sense. And the last 10, 15 minutes, I want to talk about how do we move from here to IOPs. But you know, before I literally do that, let me just stop and see if there are more questions. If you're interested to read up uh, 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 more on this, uh, this construction is known as the Mikali construction. Uh, historically, it was the first construction was SNARG, and you know it is basically the Merkle tree plus the Sphere Shamir, and it is analyzed in this uh, model where both the Merkle tree and the Sphere Shamir function, the one used for deriving randomness, are both all of them modeled as a random function. And in fact, you don't really analyze them separately; you analyze the whole construction together, and uh, you know. And then you kind of, you know, this was done in later work, you can get, you know, some expression like that to tell you about it. It's an extremely simple and, you know, very compelling construction with strong intuition. And we would have used it, you know, in the real world much more, much before uh, blockchains were cool had we had efficient PCPs. But to this day, we don't, okay? So the main issue with this construction is not really in the cryptography or the security reduction. It's really just we don't have like a, a you know good things to put there from a concrete efficiency perspective. Asymptotically, you know, we know how to put things here; they're pretty good. So just because of that, uh, we're gonna like uh, uh, we cannot really stop here, and we have to talk about IOPs. Are we together? I can o I can only speak for myself. I'm I'm enjoying it, but. Uh... <laughs> More than any, more people are also enjoying it. Uh, I'm also happy to get, uh, 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 yes, I'm following uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, confirmations that uh, not, I haven't lost everybody. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, let's continue. And this will be the last part of. Uh, maybe, maybe I, I will ask. I just want to ask, um, um, like maybe one question: what What kind of intuition should should one have for this random oracle model? Because right, the the hash function will be SHA two or Blake or SHA three, and then what is this? Uh, what do you mean by a, a random oracle or a model as a random oracle? How should we think about it, or how do you? Think yeah, so uh, in uh, cryptography, uh, whenever uh, we consider a kind of hash-based schemes, it is typically convenient uh, to not assume a specific property like uh, this function is collision resistant or this function is hard to invert. We're just going to you know, assume that the function is not even given as an efficiently computable circuit, but it's just everybody has Oracle access to the same truly random function. And of course, a truly random function kind of has a lot of properties. When you give it as input, an input, it will give you some, like, something random. It's hard to find collisions and many other things. When you model things this way, uh, first, it simply greatly simplifies the security analysis. You can get very clean 
Um, oopsie. You can get very clean expressions that can set security parameters in the real world. And so this is primarily like a matter of convenience. Now, in the particular case of this construction, it turns out that we don't have a good security analysis of uh, actually this construction under any concrete sort of notions of security for the hash function. And the main reason is that the fiat Shamir transform, this idea that you can plug in a hash function, so derive randomness in the fly, it turns out for very deep reasons, it's not easy to analyze if the hash function you're using has an efficient, has a, is efficiently computable. Because then you can start playing I don't know, like very tricky things like making the hash function, I don't know, evil. And uh, when it sees its own description, it starts misbehaving. Um, and that's something that somehow like uh, it's very hard to deal with. So in the particular case of the Mikali construction and non-interactive Starks, uh, it remains an open research frontier to uh, give an analysis under you know sort of concrete non-idealized uh, security properties of uh, this whole thing. Uh, but you know that's primary. I think it's primarily academic exercise. Uh, <laughs> All kind of like, uh, I, I think all experts believe that this construction is secure under any reasonable instantiation of a hash function in the real world. And so the, using this random function is primarily like an analysis tool for us to get expressions of this sort so we can set security parameters. It is important though that you are not using a hash function that it was designed to just be collision resistance. You need to use a general purpose so-called strong cryptographic hash function like Chatu, Chatu or you know, Blake. These are sort of, uh, that are meant to have uh, those that cryptanalysts have analyzed to approximate a random function, basically. I hope that uh, gave some uh, answer. Um, so I see there's some questions, let me parse through them. So first, uh, learning fundamentals. Well, it depends fundamentals on what specifically. For cryptography in general, there is a great course on uh, Coursera by Dan Bonnet of, uh, I think, 12 lectures. So that's probably a good place to start. Uh, uh, um, and uh, that would probably like you know give you a lot of the language you need to uh, even talk about you know, cryptography uh, 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 broadly, and in particular, this notion of random oracles. Um, I'm pretty sure that course talks about random oracles as well. Uh, the the link uh, to the online class I will uh, uh, I will let me see if I can fetch it uh, very quick I'm not sure if I can fetch it online but I will ask Ellie what's the best way to share it uh, um, later and it's just like a YouTube playlist uh, and yeah we we can send it uh, we'll try to search it online and we'll also send it by I'll try to search it and we'll also send it uh, by by email yeah uh, so that course also, and stuff and so on. Sorry, uh, we can also send a link to the, the Dan Bonnet course and to your course, and uh, okay. to you know, we'll compile some. some okay, so maybe I will put together like you know a variety of resources, and I'll uh, maybe sort of uh, annotate them so that uh, uh, that will be like a more complete answer to this question. Um, are there particular problems that are Stark friendly, or is it just anything which is nice to prove using PCPs or IOPs? Uh, yeah, I mean, because for this particular approach, because the tool responsible to talk about the, the statement being proved is the PCP or IOP. Uh, basically, anything that is you know friendly to a PCP or an IOP, then it is by extension start friendly because kind of the cryptographic hash function here is uh, is not really doing anything. I mean, it's just helping us implement the Oracle access to the proof system for for the to these oracles the query access to the oracles. And so it doesn't really care how the problem is represented. So um, all considerations uh, about how to express the problem so that you can be lost arc are, are completely considerations about the PCP or IOP. Okay, so let me continue to um, the IOP part. So let me duplicate this slide again. And let me change slide on, on my browser. All right. And so now we have an IOP. Uh, <clears throat> remember, what is an IOP? It's like a multi-round PCP. So it's a, it's a, a 
delete some things here. And you know, why do we care about multi-round PCPs? Well, it's because uh, a, you know we don't really have efficient PCPs, and uh, instead we do have a, um, efficient IOPs, and so we want to compile them into Starks. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to let's imagine let's say we're in this uh, minimally interesting situation where we have a two round IOP. Okay, in general, there may be many more rounds, but let's say we have two. Uh, so now, just gonna maybe delete this part over here. And in the original protocol, the, there was an interactive phase. Okay. And in the interactive phase, we it required the a verifier to send randomness in between, right? So this is telling us that we can still use the fiat Shamir paradigm, and now the randomness that we get out from the first root, instead of using it to derive queries, we're going to use it to tell the prover, hey, this is the randomness for the first round of the um, IOP verifier. Let me maybe write it a little bit lower down. Now, using this randomness, the prover can determine, OK, well, given this randomness, here is the uh, second PCP that I would have sent you know, in the idealized protocol. And so the prover, given that it has derived this first randomness R1, it can again say, OK, well, let's uh, again derive some uh, a Merkle tree, and now we're going to have the second root. Okay, so we had the first root, now we have the second root. And <clears throat> using the second root, it can then plug them into the hash function, right? To derive, let's say that you know we only have just uh, uh, two PCPs. Now the randomness for the queries, let's call it R query. But notice that it's important that we keep the rounds in order, right? So the in the original protocol, the second PCP really came after the first PCP, okay? It came after the randomness, but also after the first PCP. So that is why when you're deriving the, uh, um, the randomness, let's say for the queries, you know, after the second PCP, you need to depend also on what you did before. So now you're going to take the output of the previous hash function and stash that also into this one. So it keeps things in order, okay? So you're basically keeping a hash chain, you're building a hash chain that keeps the rounds in order. It forces the prover to kind of conduct the interaction with the rounds in order, okay? So now, this second randomness that we derive from the second invocation of the hash function, which depends on the first invocation of the hash function, which itself depends on the root, the first root, it can now determine queries to the second PCP and also to the first PCP, right? Because we were thinking in this sort of simplified setting where we have an interactive phase. In this case, it's just PCP randomness PCP followed by a query phase, okay? So maybe I can put a dot, dot, dot here, meaning that at this point, we have exited the interactive phase and we entered the query, query phase. And all of this is happening in the prover's head. So after that, the prover now can prepare a non-interactive so proof. And what will it include? Well, it will include the first root the, and the second root, and then it will include, you know, the answers, let's say that there are maybe two queries per round. So it will introduce, it will kind of uh, uh, reveal the uh, send to the verifier, the answers to the two queries to the first PCP, the two queries to the second PCP. And it will int introduce and will accompany them, all of them with authentication paths. And of course, the authentication paths for the first two are gonna be relative to the first root and authentication paths for the second two are gonna be relative to the second root. <clears throat> and 
And these are sent to the Stark verifier, which we're going to now kind of re rewrite down, even though it's probably obvious you know, kind of what's going to happen now. Let me just field the question. Why not use R1 as a seed for a PRG to generate the other randomness? Uh, we, well, we are using R1. Uh, you can think about it as a seed. Now, we cannot literally use a PRG because a PRG is a very specific cryptographic notion that uh, that's not what we need here. What we need is a random function. And that's essentially what we're doing. We're basically saying we're going to make the random function depend on R1, right? Because that was the, maybe that's confusing here, that there is only one output, R1. And we are using that output together with, so it's R1, right? This is still R2. And so we are deriving the, <clears throat> the final randomness for the queries, both from the randomness of the previous round and the route that the prover chose for the second round. So now, uh, <clears throat> the Stark verifier is going to kind of rederive this, all of this randomness. So it will say, okay, yes, for from root one, I will get out R1, and then from also given root two, I will get out our query, right? Now both R1 and our query are gonna be needed by the IOP verifier to run, right? But it I also have to give to the IOP verifier kind of the answers to all the queries, V1, V2, V3, V4, right? And make sure that this guy outputs one with the specific randomness derived in this order, right? So this is kind of the, the deriving the randomness in order. This is running the IOP verifier. And then I have the Merkle check, right? Which uh, I guess I don't have to write out explicitly, but basically for every leaf that was revealed, check that that specific position has been correctly certified relative to the correct route, right? And in general, you may have you know, more routes than two. Okay, now, <clears throat> So this is a, some sort of like iterated construction where the iteration is kept in order by a hash chain. A, <clears throat> like before, uh, there is a theorem that uh, relates the security of this construction to the security of the original, in this case, IOP. So, so again, theorem, so if uh, the probability to win against the IOP is epsilon IOP, then the probability to win against the, in this case, I mean, I could have already, I could have talked about the interactive variant of this one, whose number of rounds would be related to the number of rounds of the IOP, but I went straight to the non-interactive one, right? So now we're talking about non-interactive. Stark is, well, there's gonna be some term that let's we'll talk about it in a moment, plus like before T squared over two to lambda, this is kind of to rule out attacks to the Merkle tree. And the question is kind of what do I have to put here, right? Now before, just as a, as a reminder, what we had, I'm just gonna write it in, uh, before we had T times epsilon PCP, right? This was basically the resampling attack against the PCP. And now we need to understand, you know, what could a prover do to as a resample attack against an IOP, okay? And it turns out that this is a little bit more uh, involved. I mean, not that complicated, but you know, it's a little bit trickier. And the reason is that in a general IOP, you know, you could have an IOP with many rounds and the prover could explore kind of all this tree of possibilities by kind of going back and forth and saying, well, I don't write the randomness for this round, let me try it again. Oh, let me go back to the second round. I'll retry that one. And he's basically exploring this tree of possible randomnesses until he finds one that he likes. Because he could potentially say, oh, I don't like this randomness. Let me resample it. Or maybe he chooses one of these and then tries to resample this one. So it turns out that you can actually construct some uh, kind, of, uh, a, a kind of bad IOPs that perform well if you just run them once, but they perform terribly if you do these resampling attacks, okay? So you actually need the IOP. It's not true in general that you give me any IOP that has good soundness if you just run it once. 
And then it will also have good soundness here. I can't just write T times epsilon IOP. That's just not true. What is true is, 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 that, is that you can define a notion of soundness that is appropriate for this. This is something called state restoration soundness. Here, the name state restoration denotes the fact that you're considering a game where the IOP is required to be sound, where you have an adversary that tries to restore the verifier to prior states and plays random continuations. So that's like pretty, I don't know, pretty complicated to describe. Uh, instead, uh, what I will do here, I will mention that there is a strong notion of soundness, even stronger than that, that it's called a round by round soundness, okay? It basically says that these are IOPs where the roundness for every round is like strong, okay? That the probability that you can break it at that particular round is small. And basically, every IOP that we know to construct has this strong round by round soundness. And in particular, you can prove that the expression here that you should put is t times epsilon IOP of this round by round thing. Okay? So if you want to construct secure Starks from an IOP, a particular way to do that is you can construct an IOP that has a good round by round soundness adder. Okay? And that's like a pretty simple notion, and it's pretty easy to prove things about it. And again, I stress that every IOP that has ever been constructed, not by not maliciously, but you know, by design, uh, like you know, want to do something interesting, has this property. Okay, it's a very natural property. And so the expression that we get here in the end is very similar to what the one we get for a PCP, and that's how you construct efficient Starks. Okay. Uh, so let me pause here and see. Uh, so there's a question, do all rounds of IOPs have good smaller by our soundness? So <clears throat> for natural IOPs, what will typically happen is that most rounds has have amazing round around soundness, and then you really have to not to worry about it. And typically the last, the very last round, which is where you sample queries, that will be the weakest one. And that's why a uh, for natural constructions of IOPs, you have some query repetition. Uh, for example, for those of you that are familiar with the Fry protocol, which was described, I think, in one of the Stark at Home series, we do the interactive phase only once because it has very, very good round by round errors during interactive phase. But then the query phase, which is the last randomness round, is weaker. And so we repeat it a few more times. So it, it, it kind of becomes a smaller error in balance with all the others. So, but these are primarily technicalities, you know, these are things uh, also repeating number of queries is something you would have had to do also with a PCP. Uh, uh, and so this is like, pretty natural. So there's a question about, would it be possible to define a single Merkle tree instead of as many trees as the number of oracles? <clears throat> it, there is really no reason to continue working on the same Merkle tree uh, because I need to commit to that Merkle tree at a particular round and send that route. So when I find myself in the next round, I really should start a new tree because if I keep working on the old tree, my authentication paths are going to be longer and that's and I'm going to be sad, okay? Longer authentication paths means more communication from the uh, uh, you know, prover to the verifier. So might as well start a fresh tree uh, with that. Uh, <clears throat> I just, uh, I, maybe I suggest this is, uh, so, so I know you have some time constraints, so just uh, be, be aware of it. Uh, oh, thank you. Okay. So uh, let's, uh, let's, let's uh, say five minutes and uh, then uh, um, right, there's a question by Harish. PCPs are inefficient, IOPs still have PCPs. Uh, well, <clears throat> yeah, PCPs are inefficient, that's true. When I say an IOP has a PCP, it doesn't mean like it literally has one of those inefficient PCPs inside. What I meant by that, that you can send an oracle, but that's part of a bigger protocol, right? So when you design an IOP, what you put in each round is going to be in the context of designing an IOP. You're not going to take an inefficient PCP and use it there because otherwise you don't need to, you don't need to, can, you're not taking advantage of the round complexity of the extra rounds, right? So it's just in an IOP, just like in a PCP, you have the opportunity to send oracles, but in a PCP, you only have one oracle. So when you design a PCP, that's it. That's your chance. You cannot use interaction. 
when you design an IOP, well, you can send an Oracle now, then get some randomness and get an, send that an Oracle later. And so now your design choices are much bigger uh, because you can, for example, do interactive reductions. You can reduce a problem to another using interaction. Whereas in a PCP, if, had you done that, you would have had to stash in the PCP all the things that would have depended on the verify randomness for the interactive reduction, and that would blow up the PCP for all choices of randomness. Whereas here, I can just wait for the verifier to tell me which randomness, and we'll continue talking about just that randomness. So, yeah. <clears throat> now, the expressions that I wrote today, this t epsilon plus t squared over two lambda, those are against classical adversaries. It turns out that everything I described today can be um, analyzed in the so-called quantum random oracle model. That means that the adversary has a superposition access to the random function. And you can prove formally that uh, uh, these constructions are post-quantum secure in this model. The expressions change a little bit because you have you know, faster inversion, faster collision finding, but you know, they remain uh, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of interpretable expressions and something you could in principle use to set you know, parameters uh, uh, for post-quantum things in the real world. So I think this is a good place for me to not write anything else and see you know, what other questions are left over. Also, for what it's worth, I think these constructions are pedagogically very valuable. Uh, they remain extremely simple, no complicated cryptography. And uh, now it just so happens they're also uh, efficient today, but uh, they, are, they remain, to me, the simplest constructions, you know, of all, uh, just from teaching perspective, uh, than uh, anything that, for example, uses uh, pairings or uh, linear only encryption or polynomial commitment schemes, you know, so th these are like uh, very useful and exciting things. Uh, but, you know, as a, in terms of trying to explain a construction of succinct argument, uh, even interactively, these remain, I think, the most, uh, you know, drawable and uh, intuitive ones. So um, I hope you found them uh, uh, helpful. So, so maybe I think if there, you know, if there are no more questions, I, I guess on, on behalf of uh, everyone else, I, um, I, you know, greatly enjoy the. So, so I mean, you know, I've known that uh, that Ali is, is an amazing uh, speaker and uh, very, uh, you know, didactic explainer. We've enjoyed it uh, many times in the past, and I'm, uh, yeah, I'm very grateful that you joined us for this. Um, and again, I, I, I want to thank the, the audience um, for the terrific questions and, uh, and I hope to see you again in roughly three weeks on another uh, one of these uh, episodes. Uh, stay safe. Uh, pandemic is, uh, you know, raising its head again. So good health to all. All right. Uh, uh, glad to be here. Uh, hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, thanks for the great questions. And thank you. Really. Uh, thank you. Bye. Yeah, everyone.